Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to the library tour of Doom. <laughs> this is a library tour through all of my books, past, present, and yet to come, one book at a time, until we're all old and gray. <laughs> Today we're looking at a book uh, that I've had in many, many forms. Many, It's been reprinted endlessly. It's been a worldwide bestseller since the day that it arrived on the presses. And I was kind of waiting that whole time for the, ver the form, the version that I really liked. Uh, and I finally did get it. Uh, this is Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. Uh, and this is the Shambhala Press uh, edition of this thing. I don't know if you're going to be able to tell. It's smaller. It's a smaller hardcover. See that? There's a normal size trade paperback. This hardcover is smaller. Uh, it's a mass market sized hardcover with the, uh, the little built-in bookmark and with uh, a lot of the illustrations throughout that came with the original publication of Sailing Alone Around the World. This was made by Joshua Slocum, who set out from Boston uh, at the end of the 19th century and became the first person to sail single-handedly around the world in a sloop called the Spray uh, that you have there on the cover. Rigged a little odd, but still, uh, you can rig a sloop in a lot of ways. That <laughs> still doesn't change its bones, still doesn't change its DNA. Uh, and he kept a journal the whole time. He kept an, an, an extensively uh, detailed diary all during his adventures on land and on sea during the whole of the voyage around the world. Uh, not just the usual weather observations and log measurements that, that mariners keep anyway. He kept a lot of other notes. Um, thinking that maybe he would write it up as a book, and when he did, it became a huge bestseller. Uh, and it tells the story, the amazing, as far as we know, unprecedented story of someone single-handedly sailing through all weathers all the way around the world. Uh, and it has a weird mix of Mariner's Tall Tales, uh, some deeply cherished personal delusions, <laughs> and tons and tons of terrific writing just terrific, terrific writing. This is, it became, it was hailed immediately and it has since been enshrined as one of the greatest nautical works of all time. Uh, and this is the Shambhala Library version of this thing, this little, this pretty little hardcover is the Shambhala Library out of Boston. It seemed kind of fitting. And I want to give you a taste, uh, not only of what Slocum writes like, but also of the things that are captured in this book that vanished. That there are quite a few experiences in this book that are gone now. They don't exist anymore in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, Booby Harbor. A Booby Island I had seen before, but only once, however, and that was when in the steamship Suchet I was, on which I was hove down in a fever. When she steamed along this way, I, I was well enough to crawl on deck to look at Booby Island. Had I died for it, I would have seen that island. In those days, passing ships landed stores in a cave on the island for shipwrecked or distressed wayfarers. Uh, the captain of the Suchet, a good man, sent a boat to the cave with his contribution to the general store. The stores were landed in safety, and the boat, returning, brought back from the improvised, improvised post office there a dozen or more letters, most of them left by whalemen, with a request that the first homeward bound ship would carry them along to see their mailing, which had been the custom of this strange postal service for many years. Some of the letters brought back to, by our boat were directed to New Bedford and some to Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Uh, there was light today on Booby Island and regular packet communication with the rest of the world, and the beautiful uncertainty of the fate of those letters left there is a thing of the past. I made no call at the little island, but standing close in exchanged signals with the keeper of the light. Sailing on, the sloop was at once in the Arufura Sea where for days she sailed in water, milky white and green and purple. It was my good fortune to enter the sea on the last quarter of the moon, the advantage being that in the dark nights I witnessed the phosphorescent light effect at night in the greatest splendor. The sea, where the sloop disturbed it, seemed all ablaze, so that by its light I could see the smallest articles on deck, and her wake was a path of fire." And that gives you not only an idea of, uh, of what what kind of a writer Slocum is, but also captures things that are long gone. I have heard stories uh, in uh, sailing circles that there are still faraway depots where the whole goal, the sort of informal goal, despite email, despite GPS, is to leave stuff behind that others will find and forward. I've heard, I've heard stories that there are atolls where that still happens. 
but and I've also seen that kind of phosphorescence in the ocean, which can be very pretty. It's it can be also be very disturbing because it mantles sharks as they move about under the water. So that for once, you're able to see them, and how many of them there are, or how big they are. <laughs> I was on a, a sloop not any bigger than the spray once when I encountered that phenomenon and, and it, it allowed me to see a shark that was twice the size of my vessel that was patiently watching my vessel patiently, patiently ghosting us along uh, this is absolutely terrific in the way of great nautical fiction or great nautical fact I say fiction because Slocum does indulge in a whole bunch of weird stories for a large chunk of the journey of the spray he believes that he is being visited helped and advised by one of the one of Christopher Columbus's captains the captain of the Pinta <laughs> I, I don't know why he thinks that it obviously isn't true but he thinks it anyway and he invests it with a great deal of creative writing energy throughout the book so that you know I, it's little doubt there's little doubt that for long stretches I mean if you're on uh, in the in the Pacific or in the Indian Ocean you can go a long, long time. If you're the only one on board your vessel, you can go a long, long time without a single shred of human company. Without even the possibility of it. A long, long time. Maybe that preyed on Joshua Slocum's mind. Maybe not. Maybe he was just having fun. Uh, this, like I said, immediately joined the ranks of the great works of, of nautical literature and holds a place in my heart. Absolutely. Uh, there's a small number of other books along these lines, uh, one involving the gypsy moth, but this one is kind of a hallowed place. So I was, I was, I've had it in trade paperbacks, I've had it in little hardcovers, I've had it in little mass market paperbacks that I read until they fell apart. Uh, but I was waiting for the Shambhala Press one, I eventually found it, so very happy about that. And of course, uh, Joshua Slocum had just the end that any dyed-in-the-wool, salt-hearted mariner would want, which is that he disappeared at sea. <laughs> He, he set sail and never returned. Uh, and there are all sorts of, stall, of tall, stories, stall, tall stories about that as well, about people who, you know, accounts decades and decades ago of people who thought they'd met him, people who thought they'd partied with him, <laughs> people who thought they'd, they'd killed him or helped him to kill someone else, all sorts of, of uh, secondary anecdotes that have sprung up around this book but the book is worth revisiting infinitely I have I have read this I don't know how many times <laughs> and, and that is going to be a large characteristic of the library tour of doom as I've mentioned this, it's a large characteristic is going to be that I've read these books many many times a number of you pointed out that I should also make room for the books that I've read and disliked the ones I don't have anymore and I am going to do that but uh, there's a there's a breeze that's that's a little bit redolent of the ocean today, and that's the first breeze that Boston has had in five, six days, so I, it made me think along, along seafaring lines. So there you go, uh, Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. If you haven't read it, if you, then you really should treat yourself. And if, I don't know how many of you are watching this, have ever set foot on board a wind-driven vessel. I actually don't know that. Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know how I would, I would guess at the percentages. Is it ninety percent who have not? I don't even know. I, I I have no idea how many of you. I'm assuming it's very few. Have taken a wind-driven vessel out past sight of land. I'm assuming that the number of people who've done that is very few. Uh, even if you are in that huge percentage who who are what, what Jack Aubrey would call a grass combing swab, <laughs> you're still going to love this book. It is, it is high entertainment. So there you go. That's your library tour of Doom for today. I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.